right, we're going to finish up with uh, Sam Passy. He's a medical student here at the University of Utah and has been on the cornea rotation. And we saw some pretty interesting cases while he was on, and he's going to present um, some of the cases that we saw and talk a little bit about band keratopathy and interstitial keratitis. Okay, thank you uh, for having me uh, come to speak today. So I'll be covering two corneal diseases today, band keratopathy and interstitial keratitis. I was initially inspired to give this presentation based off a patient I was able to see with Dr. Mifflin in cornea clinic a few weeks ago. Uh, these, first, these first images are actual images we were able to obtain from the patient. Um, she's a 55-year-old female with a history of neurotrophic cornea in the left eye, secondary to HSV infection. Uh, with significant band keratopathy um, and interstitial keratitis. These first few images are kind of highlighting the band keratopathy, and I think they give us a good introduction um, as we'll begin our discussion. So the definition of band keratopathy, it's a chronic degenerative condition of the cornea uh, characterized by greater white opacities of calcium precipitates um, in the superficial layers of the stroma, typically in this inner palpebral region, which you can see nicely on the images. The pathophysiology, I think, can really be boiled down if we think about just concentration and pH of the tears in this inner palpebral region. Um, the inner palpebral region, of course, has the highest rate of tear evaporation, the highest rate then of solute concentration of your tears. So that makes sense. And then you'd see um, band keratopathy then commonly in patients with severe dry eye or corneal exposure syndrome. Additionally, with respect to concentration, uh, if you think of any disease with systemic increase, specifically in calcium, um, that calcium is going to be increased within the tear, and then with the addition of evaporation, will be further concentrated, often to the point tipping past solubility. If we think of pH, uh, the inner palpebral zone actually loses a lot of carbon dioxide, which is an acid. So you have an increased baseline pH in this region, which increases your um, rate of calcium precipitation or decreases the solubility. And further in diseases, which we'll get to in a little bit, like chronic inflammatory diseases of the eye, you can have a further increase in the pH um, leading to calcium precipitation. The presentation, so the calcium precipitates, uh, you can see these images in the Bowman's layer in the anterior stroma, initially as granules um, and then coalesce and can lead to fragmentation of Bowman's layer, disruption of the epithelium, so your patients often present with eye pain, foreign body sensation, uh, decreased vision, and they can get clear from the um, salt precipitates. On exam, the characteristic inner palpebral uh, gray-white haze with a rough surface. And if we were to look histologically um, at the cornea in these patients, on the top right, you can see an H and E stain. Um, the basophilic <coughs> staining or the purple staining regions are the calcium in Bowman's layer. And you can use a special stain to look for calcium, like a Rossa stain on the bottom right, where calcium looks black. I like to think of the differential diagnosis into three main categories. Um, ocular, systemic, and chemical. Uh, with respect to ocular, I think of sick eyes, chronically inflamed eyes that are going to alter the pH and lead to calcium deposition or in precipitation. So chronic uveitis classically associated with band keratopathy, additional JIA and thesis, and then diseases that affect the evaporation of tears, so dry eye syndrome, corneal exposure, which we touched on briefly, and then systemic, anything with that's going to increase your systemic co concentration of either calcium or phosphorus, so hyperparathyroidism, hypervitaminosis D, um, multiple myeloma, sarcoid pagets, and then chronic renal failure is very commonly associated with band keratopathy, but in this case, you can actually have low to uh, normal calcium levels, but it's the hyperphosphatemia. Over the years, a number of chemicals have been identified to be associated with uh, band keratopathy. On the top of the list is silicone oil, uh, which we see often in patients after retinal detachment. And then, more historically, chronic use of phosphate-containing steroids. To further narrow your differential, you can order a series of labs to check their patient's serum calcium phosphorus, renal function, ACE if you're looking for sarcoid, PTH for parathyroid. Um, in histology, if you were to look at um, some of these corneas to better differentiate, you're going to see uh, Bowman's layer calcium deposition as well as intercellular calcium deposition. But in cases with uh, hypercalcemia, you'd actually see intracellular as well. Indications for treatment are really just to decrease vision or mechanical irritation um, with the patient as soon as it covers that central visual access. 
The mainstay of treatment is uh, surgical debridement, uh, followed by EDTA chelation therapy. Here's a nice image of band keratopathy before and after treatment. Uh, the treatment's pretty straightforward, simple. It can be done under topical anas anesthesia. First, you remove the epithelium with either a sponge or a blade, apply this EDTA chelation uh, treatment. Um, and then if there's further calcium deposits, you can remove with blunt dissection of a spatula or blade and then cover the corneal defect with either bandage contact lens. Uh, some people use amniotic membranes. Contraindications are really any disease in which we'd be um, risking a persistent epithelial defect. Prognosis, the visual and symptomatic outcomes are generally very good um, with surgery. However, the recurrence rate is uh, very high if the underlying diseases are not corrected, which is understandable. Move on now to talk about interstitial keratitis. These next images are from the same patient and are trying to highlight the interstitial keratitis, specifically uh, the neovascularization, which is extremely remarkable in this patient. In this one I like, you can see it actually going all the way into the central visual access. And this is a favorite, my favorite image we were able to obtain. And in the, in the middle, all these tiny little red specks or individual red blood cells you can visualize within the cornea. And in clinic, you could see these just flowing through this maze of new vessels in this normally avascular tissue, which was quite remarkable. So the definition of interstitial keratitis, commonly referred to as IK, it's a non-ulcerative inflammatory um, condition of the corneal stroma, uh, characterized by non-superative cellular infiltrate, often accompanied by vascularization, and then of course not primarily involving either the epithelium or endothelium. Pathophysiology, it's thought to be mostly immune-mediated against antigens, both infectious and non-infectious in the corneal stroma, accompanied by cellular infiltration. So these patients are gonna have red eyes, painful eyes, uh, photophobia, blurred vision. On exam, you can see um, corneal haze, often stromal neovascularization, ghost vessels if it's in the quiescent stage, and sometimes lipid keratopathy. I like to think of the differential for interstitial keratitis into four main categories, viral, bacterial, parasitic, and autoimmune related. Viral being the most common, and within viral, HSV is the most common um, cause in the United States currently. And other viral etiologies include uh, VZV, so zoster, EBV, and then more rarely measles, mumps. Bacteria, um, congenital syphilis was really pathognomonic, or was really hand in hand with interstitial keratitis uh, many years ago, and is still a common cause of the disease, but less so now than HSV. Also acquired syphilis, and then more rare things like TB, uh, leprosy, Lyme disease. Parasitic, uh, mostly in the United States, we're looking at patients with acanthamoeba. Infections can lead to interstitial keratitis, and then other regions of the world, other, other parasites. When we think of autoimmune related, we often think of Kogan syndrome, which is a hypersensitivity reaction uh, to what they think is a shared antigen within the corneal stroma and the inner ear. So these patients often present with vestibular symptoms, ocular symptoms, and then classically with uh, a vasculitis as well. To further narrow your differential, a good uh, history, talking about travel, tick bites, uh, recent herpes, exposure to TB, vestibular symptoms, and then labs you'd consider ordering. Of course, it'd be a syphilis labs, viral serologies, a PPD, and maybe a chest X-ray. Here's a table um, from a study, 10-year uh, study done with 97 patients with interstitial keratitis, showing the etiologies more recently. And s significant to note in the right-hand column, you see HSV is by far the most common, 34 out of 97 patients, followed by idiopathic and then syphilitic. Here's a table from a different study that sought to kind of characterize interstitial keratitis and uh, identifies some of the key uh, presenting characteristics of each cause. Um, and of note, herpes is typically seen unilaterally, often associated with decrease in corneal sensation and iritis. The treatment for interstitial keratitis um, is really depends on which etiology, and you can see there's a number of etiologies. However, there's a common theme, um, and so we usually treat with a steroid drop for the eye um, plus systemic treatment. Um, and interestingly enough, for example, HSV, the most common, often these, uh, the systemic treatment or putting this patient on antivirals or with syphilis, putting them on penicillin, doesn't really affect the um, progression of interstitial keratitis or decrease the time uh, to resolution, but it just prevents systemic disease and recurrence. The prognosis of visual outcomes are generally very good if treated early with the appropriate treatment. Complications do occur, including corneal scarring, corneal thinning, and perforation. 
Here are my references. I'd like to acknowledge and thank Dr. Mifflin for his help, Dr. Ambadi, um, Linda Taylor for the images, and the Moran Eye Center for allowing me to rotate. And this is my 11-day-old uh, first little boy. Any questions? Mm -hmm. It's also important to ask about contact um, mm -hmm. as in other people who uh, might have had herpes. Uh, I'll, there's a patient I'll never forget in Honduras. She came in, she just had epidural keratitis uh, from HSV. We talked with her, we treated her. At the very end, she left, and then she came back and kind of sheepishly asked if you can get this in your eye from someone kissing you on the eye with a cold sore. And her boyfriend had just 10 days before I mean, I mean, from what I've read, it's pretty much the level of calcium, the, solu the solubility of calcium and phosphorus in the tear film is already pretty much at the tipping point. So anything that just to push that over. And then with the silicone oil, the, the mechanism isn't widely understood, but they think it essentially disrupts the endothelium, decreases or alters the metabolism. They think maybe decreasing the rate of production of lactic acid byproducts, so you decrease your acid, so you increase your pH again. So I think the concentration of pH really comes down to, again, you can try to understand it that way. But it's really at that tipping point already, from what I understand. <laughs>